Hey everyone, it's Matt here with Nightrun Studio, and in this new mini-series, we're adding treasure chests and magic spells. In this first video, we'll start by adding a new spell cast state to our player, as well as our first spell, teleportation. Alright, we've got lots to do, so let's get started. Now our first step is going to be to actually make a spell cast input action, so let's head into the input actions and add a new action. I'm going to call this one spell cast. It'll be of type button, and we are going to add an interaction for press, and yes, we want to detect on press and release in this case. You can then open it up to set our key bindings. I'm going to be setting mine to use the L button. I'll make sure to set that this is a keyboard and mouse input and then save the asset. With that done, let's set up our code to actually use those inputs so we can head into our player script first of all. And down here where we keep track of our bools for all of our other inputs, let's add a public bool for spellcast pressed. We can then head on down to the bottom, right below where we do our attack pressed. And actually, I'm just going to copy that method completely as it's pretty much the same idea. Here, we'll make a public void on spellcast pressed, and we'll just make that spellcast pressed bool follow whatever the value is. So it'll be true when pressed and false when not. That's all we need to run our first test. We can head into play mode, and if I click on my player and look at the player script, we can see that when I press L, it is in fact toggling the spellcast pressed. Now that our inputs are working, let's go ahead and create a new mono behavior script, and we'll call this one player spellcast state. Once we get in here, we can just do our usual state setup, getting rid of the start and update method, making sure we inherit from player state instead of mono behavior, and then setting up our constructor using the name of this class, taking in a reference to our player script, and then passing that reference along to the base, which is our player state. Let's start off with an override enter method. And this is just going to set our anim's bool for is casting to be true. We can then copy that method and just change it to exit. Don't forget to change the base exit and make sure that we set is casting false. Now exiting the state will be done via an animation event similar to what we did in our attack script. So we can use the override method we already have for on attack animation finished. However, we're going to rename this and sort of repurpose it as it won't always be attack animations. We want to be able to use this for other states anytime we're finishing an animation. So let's head to our player state and just rename this one. I'm going to hit Command R in order to replace all instances of it. So let's head on back to our player script where we can rename this as just animation finished. And you'll notice mine already changed the current state call to animation finished, but yet if your replace didn't work, you'll have to do that here as well. Next, we'll just pop into our combat script and change its call to just animation finished. That said, we can leave the name of this method to attack animation finished, as this method will only ever get called from an attack animation. All right, with that renaming foolishness out of the way, we can head back to our spellcast state. And here, we're just going to do a couple of checks. So when our animation says we finished the spellcast, we'll check to see if our move input on the X has an absolute value greater than a really small amount. If so, that means we're trying to move, and so we want to tell our player to change state to the move state. We can then add an else statement, and if that's not the case, just tell our player to change state to idle. Now we've just got a little state machine set up to do. Let's head to player and make sure that it actually has a reference to this new player spellcast state. And also make sure that when the game begins, we actually create the state. And make sure to pass along a copy of this script to it. At this point, we are almost ready to test, but we need to make sure we're actually entering this state at some point. And the two main places we'll do this is, first of all, from our player idle state. So let's come to the top of update and just do a check. So if spellcast is pressed, we're going to want to tell our player to change state to the player.spellcast state. Though, you'll notice it's not liking the spellcast pressed. Let's just quickly head over to our player state and set that up the same way that we have for our other inputs. So here we're just going to make a protected bool called spellcast pressed, and we're going to add a getter here so that whenever we check it, it will just look at player and return the value of the player spellcast pressed bool. Finally, we just want to make sure to add an else to the if statement below. That way we don't try to do spellcasting and attacking at the same time, which can cause some hiccups in the game. This way only one of these statements can be accessed at a time. Then let's go ahead and copy that and head over to our player move state, where we can paste that in right at the top. And then just also make sure to add the else statement on the next line. All right, let's save all just as we've been in a lot of scripts here. Now we can't do much here until we have an animation. So let's click on our player's sprite, drag our animation pane into place, and then create a new clip. I'm just going to go to my animation folder here and create a new clip, which I'm just going to call casting. 
If you're using Brolove's generic character pack like I am, I'm going to be using the first pack and starting in number 54 through to 61. We can just shift click all of those at once and drag them up top. Don't forget to grab the last frame and just make sure it repeats. That way it'll last the same length as all those other frames. And then we can drag it out. I'm going to make mine take place over about 30 frames. All right, I'm going to head to my animator window and hide the animation pane here. We can then just drag it casting up top here by attack and let's make a transition going in and then right click and make a transition out. At this point, we need a way to govern when we actually head in there. So let's create a new parameter. This one will be a bool called is casting. Keep in mind, this has to be the same name that we used in our state. We'll click on the transition into casting and make sure that when is casting is true, we enter. And then on the way out, make sure when is casting is false. We do want to play the entire animation, so we'll give it an exit time of one, but we don't need any special duration here. With that done, when you get in the game, you should be able to press L or whatever your spell cast button is and get an animation playing, but you'll notice it plays on repeat. I'm just going to quickly search casting and make sure that I take off loop time in order to fix that problem, but we've got more work to do here yet. Now we need to actually define what happens when we cast this spell. To do this, we're going to create something similar to what we did with combat for our attack. So we're going to create a new core component script, which we're going to call magic. I'm then just going to click on my sprite here, and we can go ahead and add this new component on. All right, let's open it up. So we can start by getting rid of the start and update method, and then we are going to need a reference to our player, so let's set that up at the top. Next, we'll add a public void animation finished method. And whenever this gets called, we just want to relay the message on to player so it can inform the states. We're also going to want to cast a spell. Now this private void cast spell method will get much more complex later as we route to different types of spells. But for now, let's just go ahead and call teleport. Now we're going to define a few parameters here and later on we'll move those into a scriptable object for specific spells. But for now, for simplicity, we'll just keep them in magic. Let's make a public float for our spell range. And now, down in teleport, we're going to calculate the direction we need to move. So to do this, we'll make a new vector 2, which will just look at our player's facing direction. And then for the y, set it to 0. Unless, of course, you want to teleport up or down, in which case you could put a value there. Now that we know what direction we're going, we can calculate our target position. And this is just going to be equal to the player's transform dot position with the direction added onto it. Now, we won't like that at first because player position comes through as a vector 3, so we're just going to cast it as a vector 2 so it ignores the z value. We're then also going to go to our direction and make sure that we multiply that by our spell range. Now, one more line before we test this, and that is just to set our player's transform position to be equal to our target position. We have a little setup to do in Unity, so let's click on our player's sprite, make sure that it knows where the player is, so we can drag our player in there, give it a spell range. I'm going to start with five. And then next, we actually need to go to our animation. We'll open up casting. And then on the final frame, let's add an animation event. This can call the function from our magic script that we just created. And here we're going to use animation finished. Now in play mode, we can see that we are able to teleport in both directions across gaps. However, we have a little problem. And that is that we can also teleport into walls. Additionally, there's no cooldown yet. So let's fix both those problems. So we're going to need a couple more parameters for our spell here. The first one is going to be a public float called player radius. Additionally, we want to add the cooldown information. So here we're going to make a public bool called can cast, and it's going to perform a little function. So anytime we call this, it's going to check to see if the current time, so time.time, .time, is greater than or equal to our next cast time. Now for the moment, next cast time is just going to be a private float, and then we're also going to need a public float for however long our spell cooldown is. All right, let's put this into action. Now next cast time is just going to be equal to the current time, and we're just going to add to it our spell cooldown. So if the time is two seconds into the game and we cast a spell and the cooldown is one second, we won't be able to cast again until three seconds into the game. So first of all, if we head to our idle state, we want to make sure that if spell cast is pressed and can cast is true, then we'll enter the state. However, at the moment, you can see that it doesn't like can cast. So let's head to our player state. And similar to what we did with combat, we're just going to make a protected magic reference and then make sure that we add it in our constructor here, making sure that this magic is equal to the player's version of magic. Though, of course, player doesn't yet have a reference to magic, so we'll do that next. Now, when we head back to idle state, we can check if spell cast is pressed and if magic is telling us we can cast. We'll add the exact same condition into our move state. 
and now we'll be able to have a cooldown as well as a check for the button press. That'll fix our cooldown issue, but next we want to fix the problem of being able to teleport inside of walls. So let's come on down into teleport and we're going to set up a collider 2D reference here called hit. And what this is just going to do is use our physics 2D overlap circle. So similar to how we detect enemies in our attack state. And this time our overlap circle is going to start at target position. So that's the position we're trying to teleport to. It's going to take into account the player's radius, so make a circle that size, and it's going to check to see if there's anything belonging to an obstacle layer. We haven't created that yet, so we'll just come up top and make a layer mask here called obstacle layer. So now after we've done that check, we're going to add an if statement. So if hit is not null, meaning our hit detected something belonging to the obstacle layer, that means we can't teleport there. However, we don't want to just abort altogether, so instead we're going to see where we can teleport to. So we're going to create a float called step, and we'll make this 0.1, and this is just going to backtrack 0.1 units at a time, looking for an available place. We'll make a vector to adjusted position, which is going to be the new point we're checking, and that'll start at our target position. However, and here we're going to use a while loop, and so as long as hit is not null, so we keep finding that there's an obstacle in the way, and the distance between our adjusted position and the player's position is greater than zero. That's because we don't want this to send us backwards. We're just going to check the position in front of the player. Now, as long as that's true, we're going to continually have our adjusted position subtract by our direction multiplied by step. So if we're facing right, it'll just keep going backwards by a positive step number and vice versa if we're facing left. At this point then, we can actually just copy this line up top here for hit as we're gonna check again to see if there's an obstacle in the way. If there is, we'll continue the loop and if not, we're gonna head out of the loop. Now, once we get out of this loop, we can finally set our target position to be equal to that adjusted position we just calculated and then we can actually teleport there. That said, one little mistake here, we actually don't want to be checking the target position each time. It'll just keep checking the wrong place, which will create an infinite loop. Make sure that you change that to adjusted position. All right, no setup necessary. You should be able to test now, and it should continue to work as it did before. However, now if we try to teleport into something like this wall, it will actually only teleport us as close as we can go. So we won't be able to teleport at all up close, but here we can get close at least. All right, we now have a working teleport script. Please join me for the next video where we're going to add a spark or lightning type area effect magic, and then we'll keep going from there. Hope to see you in those videos. Until then, this is Matt with Nightrun Studio. Cheers.